Division Director for uh, the Infectious Disease Division here at Emory. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to welcome you to our Infectious Disease Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today. Um, it's, um, I'm here to introduce a team of speakers. Uh, the topic is going to be about um, a number of emerging um, infections that have caused outbreaks in recent years that I think will be of general interest, but we've also asked them, the speakers, to present it to you in a way that will um, emphasize the fact that you all as uh, practicing clinicians are on the front lines of recognition, early recognition warning signs of these outbreaks as they uh, emerge. So we want you to be thinking about it from the standpoint of uh, in your clinical practice, uh, what you might be looking for, how you might recognize um, these outbreaks at ground zero at the first case. So we have three speakers. I'll just mention all of them right now and then they'll come up in sequence. Our first speaker is Sharon Sai, who is um, currently at CDC. She's an EIS officer. She's an infectious disease trained physician from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she and Mary Beth Sexton, our second speaker, actually were overlapping co-residents at Columbia University. Um, and uh, she is uh, a medical epidemiologist in the EIS program. So she's going to be talking uh, first, and we'll talk to you about um, a particular outbreak um, that she's been very intimately involved in in her role in the mycotic section at CDC, and I won't spoil what it is. Um, and then Mary Beth Sexton is our second speaker. She is currently a, uh, the director of antibiotic stewardship here at Emory University Hospital and the assistant hospital epidemiologist. She's a former fellow from our training program, and as I said, she went to Columbia for residency and originally was here at Emory for medical school. And then our final cleanup hitter, um, to wrap it up for us, is Dr. John McGowan, who um, I was just reminded is from the EIS class at CDC of 1969. So we have a current EIS officer and one who is a, an alumnus from 1969. He is currently a professor of epidemiology in the School of Public Health here at Emory, but also a, uh, a cherished member of our division, infectious disease, for many, many years, has a background in hospital infections, in medical microbiology, um, and is an, a full-fledged epidemiologist and has been involved in all kinds of outbreaks through the years of his um, very distinguished career. So with that, we'll start with Sharon Sai and welcome her up for the first case. Thank you guys, it's great to be here. Um, it's nice to be in the clinical world. Um, so I guess, should I go through these objectives for everyone um, just to start out? Okay, or we'll, we'll skip through them for, for now. So. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about Candida auris, which um, has been emerging as the next fungal superbug. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our experience at CDC and how you can help us um, hopefully not find it here. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a clinical case. Um, so really the overview here is this is an ICU patient with recent healthcare exposure. So um, this is a 68 year old gentleman with hypertension, atrial fibrillation, COPD and hep C related liver disease who presented to the hospital with fever and respiratory distress, really kind of vague symptoms. He just arrived to visit family in the US from Pakistan where he had recently been hospitalized for more than three weeks in the ICU there. And so he had some of the sequela of that. He had a large decubitus ulcer requiring a wound vac. He had a trach and he was known to be colonized with multiple multidrug resistant organisms, including MRSA and an extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli. And so he was admitted to the ICU for respiratory distress, um, started on mechanical ventilation, had a central line and fully placed and started on broad spectrum antibiotics, probably something similar to some of your experience. His respiratory status got a little better, but on day two of his hospital stay, blood cultures returned positive for yeast with an identification pending. So you don't know yet what's going on, but he was started on mycofungin. As we know, the IDSA guidelines for, um, for yeast in the blood are starting folks on mycofungin as, um, or one of the echinocandins as our first line agent now. So the next day, there was a preliminary identification on that yeast, and it was Candida chemoloniae, which is a rare species that doesn't typically cause infections at human body temperature. So the lab was a little suspicious. They sent it out for sequencing. The ICU clinician also astutely requested antifungal susceptibility testing at this point, and the patient remained on mycofungin. So a couple days later, you find out Candida auris. So at this point, you know the identification, and the susceptibility testing comes back and shows that it's resistant to fluconazole and amphotericin B. 
So, so this is kind of the setup, and um, I wanted to give a little background on candidemia. You guys see candida in the hospital. You know this is a, a commensal organism that you're going to see on the wards, but it really is a good reminder that it can also cause serious invasive infections. And we know that candidemia is actually um, the most common organism that causes healthcare-associated bloodstream infections in a recent U.S. point prevalence survey of healthcare-associated infections. Um, in infections can really... Um, change incidence depending on the population. So we think between about five and 15 per 100,000 population, which averages out to just a little under 50,000 cases a year. Um, but mortality is generally pretty high. So we think these patients are often sick, so um, other things can be going on, but, but we know 30-day all-cause mortality is about 30%. And we've been seeing increasing resistance to Canada in Canada in recent years. So for example, Canada Glabrata um, has been showing increasing resistance to fluconazole and also to echinocandins, like mycofungin, more recently. So risk factors for candidemia, we really think about it being a lot like C. diff. So if you think about the things that put your patient at risk for C. diff, so broad-spectrum antibiotic use, immunocompromising medications or status, prolonged ICU stays, abdominal surgery, and also central lines. And typically, we think about the source of infection in candidemia as being auto-infection. So from the patient's own gut flora, you think about your neutropenic patients, maybe someone who underwent abdominal surgery. We don't usually think about candida as being transmitted in a hospital. Um, there have been a few documented outbreaks with one species you've heard of, candida parapsilosis, but those are typically rare and usually have sort of a point source. And species identification tends to be fairly predictable for candida. So the following chart shows species distribution for over 7,000 isolates from our candidemia surveillance, which is population-based surveillance through the Emerging Infections Program. And you can see that Canada albicans really accounts for most, although actually in the past it really accounted for over 50%. But in recent years, Canada clobrata, which I mentioned is concerning because of its increasing resistance, has started to um, pop up as causing a lot more. But you can see other Canada species really account for smaller proportions. So the question here is back to our case, why do we care about Canada aurus, this, this sort of um, obscure and maybe you've never heard of one? So maybe a more apt title would be why we care about this obscure Canada species called C. aurus. So as, as a lot of things do these days, our interest in C. aurus at CDC started with an email back in February of 2015, and our Pakistani colleagues actually were concerned about a number of Saccharomyces cerevisiae isolates that they had seen at their hospital, and that's... Um, if you're unfamiliar, uh, a yeast that's called a bre the brewer's yeast, it's often in probiotics, but it doesn't typically cause sort of outbreaks or clusters like this. And they actually had over a third of them were bloodstream isolates. And so as it turns out, it wasn't Saccharomyces at all, um, but in their lab they were using a commercial test kit that misidentified it. Um, and once those isolates were sequenced, it was found that they were all Candida auris. So I keep mentioning Candida auris. Why didn't you hear about this in medical school? You know, where did this come from? So this is actually a new species of Candida. It was first identified in 2009 during the course of a study in Japan in someone's ear, which is why they named it auris. So not aureus, like gold, like staff, but auris, like ear. Um, and then since 2009, we've seen it pop up in a number of different countries. So reports of single cases, reports of clusters in hospitals, and also antifungal resistance. Um, as I've mentioned, that has been popping up in other candida species like the glabrata. The early epidemiology from these reports suggested that risk factors were really similar to what I already mentioned for candidemia, um, but some patients had been on antifungal treatment when they were diagnosed with this, which is sort of starting to highlight the resistance. Mortality was also a lot higher than what I told you before, up to 60% in these patients, and a lot of them also had other conditions. And the clustering in the hospitals was really bothersome. This really shouldn't be something that you would see Canada do. So based on these initial reports, we were starting to learn that Canada auris really presents some new challenges to us. And, and first, as I mentioned already, it can be misidentified using laboratory identification systems that are common. So as you heard in the case, the patient's Canada was misidentified as Hemolonii, which is a rare species, um, and in the Pakistani cluster is Saccharomyces. So this is a problem and, and would cause people to potentially miss cases. And second, we were finding um, resistance to antifungal drugs. So as, as you all know, practicing clinicians, there are three main classes of antifungals that we use. Um, azoles like fluconazole, polyenes like amphotericin, and echinocandins like mycofungin. Um, the early reports actually showed that almost all of the isolates were resistant to fluconazole, 
about a third were resistant to amphotericin B, and there was a small fraction that was res resistant also to echinocandins, and there were a few isolates that were resistant to all three, organis uh, all three classes, which is really unprecedented and left no sort of treatment options for these patients. And the third thing we saw is this potential for outbreaks. So I was telling you about the clustering that we really just don't see in Canada. So this, this really bothered us and um, really got our attention actually when we heard about an outbreak in a UK hospital. And this was a large hospital, really similar to some place like, like Emory, a big academic medical center. We heard about an outbreak in their ICU there where they had nine bloodstream infections and more than 40 people colonized on the skin. Um, they did culturing from many hospital surfaces and found it there. And there were also episodes that were clear patient to patient transmission. And the alarming thing about this outbreak was that it was really hard to control. So people were put on contact precautions. Um, any patients that went through that ICU and especially roommates and others had um, screening. Even though there's no evidence for it, they did chlorhexidine bathing of all the patients and then cleaned their rooms three times a day with bleach. And they actually, when a patient left a room, would do even more aggressive cleaning with higher concentration bleach. And they were still seeing new cases and ultimately they had to shut down the ICU to really stop transmission. Um, so, you know, here in the U.S., we're thinking, this, is, this sounds problematic. Um, do we have it here? Do we, you know, do, we need to, do we need to be concerned about this? So you guys might have seen this last summer. We sent out a clinical alert to healthcare facilities saying, please look for this, you know, kind of detailing what I mentioned to you already. Here's how it can be misidentified. Here's the resistance patterns. Um, and so we started to hear from folks. So the answer is yes, we do have it here. And as of August um, of last year, we'd heard about seven cases. All of these were people had looked back in their um, hospital labs and, and found them. There was only one case that really was newly identified sort of um, prospectively. You can see they came from four states. And at this point, we weren't, we weren't sure if these were just imported from places that had ongoing transmission. Um, but over the course of the fall, it be became clear that there was some ongoing transmission occurring. You can see here the same four states, but escalating cases in blue in New York. And so I actually went out um, twice last fall to help investigate these cases. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, most recently, um, we have uh, over 120 cases in the US, um, still primarily from um, specific states and, um, and several that are sort of just imported cases in, in individual states. So you can see New York and Jersey, New Jersey have been primarily affected and there we think there's sort of ongoing transmission there where in a few other states there's been a case, kind of like the case I described to you, where we've had one person who's um, had healthcare exposure in a place with ongoing transmission and we haven't seen other cases surrounding that. So epidemiologic characteristics of the cases here in the US, um, the majority have been from the blood. Um, you can see urine being the second most common um, with similar resistance pattern to what I previously described. So almost all resistant to fluconazole and some um, about a third to amphotericin, just a few to echinocandins. We haven't seen any here in the US um, up to this point that have been resistant to all three classes. These are older adults, so median age of 70 and about 30% 30-day mortality, so closer to what um, we mentioned as far as candidemia um, that's known. And they often have multiple underlying conditions, just like our case did, with indwelling devices. So tracheostomy, central lines, and gastrostomy tubes have been very common. And in the places with ongoing transmission in New Jersey and New York, what we've seen is this pattern of extensive healthcare exposure. So a lot of residents of long-term care, often like nursing homes with ventilator units going back and forth to the hospital. This is really the population that seems to be at risk. Um, again, several recent cases had travel and healthcare exposures abroad, and so four different cases um, coming from India, Pakistan, Venezuela, and South Africa, places that we know there's ongoing transmission in, in healthcare facilities. Um, and in addition to you know, testing um, roommates and trying to determine colonization and contact tracing, we, we also did environmental testing in hospitals, and you can see here by the red dots, we, we found Canada auris all over people's hospital rooms places close to the bed, places farther away. Um, you know, fortunately, the small amount of testing we've done after using agents like bleach, we haven't been able to find it, but just sort of a reminder that this, this is um, very different from what we expect for Canada in the hospital. So I could talk for an hour about the different investigations that I've been out on, but just to give you a general framework of how we're helping our state and local partners before I tell you, you know, what you can be doing here in the hospital, 
Um, really, all of this has started with case notifications. Um, we've established an email account at CDC, and our state and local partners can get in touch with us that way. Um, the first thing we do with any case is implement and reinforce infection control measures, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, and then do this microbiology laboratory review, where, which has allowed us to find other cases by finding these suspicious isolates. We've also done contact tracing and swabbing to identify other colonized patients, and then considered point prevalence surveys in, in units where we think there's transmission. So a specific ICU, like I described to you in the UK, or a nursing um, home floor, something like that, we would, we would do some additional swabbing. So now that you've heard all of that, what should you guys know here at Emory? Because we don't know about any cases here, unless you guys do. Um, what, how should you be on the lookout? So, when should you suspect Cioris? So my understanding is, in talking to some colleagues here, that you guys actually have this technology at the bottom called MultiTOF, which um, is a lab um, uh, machine that can do identification and, and is, is sufficient for finding Cioris. Um, but if you have colleagues in other places or if you practice at other places, if you get a yeast that's identified as one of these listed here, one of these really rare ones, Canada Chemolonii, Fomata, Sake, um, another yeast called Rhodoterula glutinous, um, or someone tries to get an ID and can't. Those are the things that should really key you in, that you might have Canada Oris. If you have a Canada that's resistant to one or more antifungal drugs. And then the third thing that we've really been thinking more about recently is, you know, as you guys know, we don't, the lab doesn't speciate every Canada from every body site. You know, they really do that from sterile sites. But if you have a patient who's recently traveled or had health care in one of these places with ongoing transmission, it may be worth requesting speciation on any Canada that that patient has. So if they have one from their urine, it's a good idea to ask the lab to do a species ID, because that could be um, a way to identify a case that you otherwise wouldn't have seen. If you do find a case, the first thing to do is um, to notify us at CDC and your state and local partners. I'm sure the infection control will be all over it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a point to make here is that even if there's no clinical indication to treat that case, so if you do identify it from the urine, we still want to hear about that case. Um, if the patient does clinically indicate, um, have treatment, an echina candida not a standard dosing is the first line therapy, and we'd strongly suggest ID consultation, especially because really you need careful monitoring for treatment failure. We know about one case in the U.S. already that had a bloodstream infection, resistant to fluconazole, was treated with mycofungin, and subsequently developed a kind of candin resistance. Um, and so this is something that this organism seems to be able to do almost like bacteria can um, with exposure. So we're really concerned about ensuring that, that patients don't fail um, treatment. And then infection control recommendations and measures are really the, the mainstay for what we're trying to do at this point. And those include contact precautions with a single room, just like a lot of your other MDROs, Reinforcing hand washing so you can use alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. And I point that out because the um, agents that we recommend for use are those that are effective against C. diff, but you don't need to use soap and water the way that you would for C. diff necessarily. Um, this does come up, you know, when you're leaving a room with your stethoscope, you need to think about which wipe to use. So you want to use the bleach wipes, you know, if, if this were to come up, if this is um, a patient that you had. And then notification to any facility. So if you're writing that discharge summary or if you're calling another facility for transfer, you really want to make sure that you relay that this patient has um, this and, and the need for precautions, especially because it's an emerging infection that a lot of clinicians might say it's candida. I don't need to do anything special, but it's really important at this point to educate those people who are helping take care of your patient. So just in summary, I just wanted to point out that, you know, Cioris has really created a paradigm shift in how we think about candida infections at CDC and also and clinically. And, um, you know, we all think about thrush or vaginal candidiasis, but this is really a reminder that yeast can cause invasive infections with high mortality. And um, this one in particular has these challenges in identification and multidrug resistance that are really concerning in addition to the transmission and persistence in the healthcare environment. So at this point, your help in identifying any cases and really putting into place infection control measures are what we need at this point to control its spread. And we're hopeful with, although we have a little over 100 cases in the U.S., that they're still in pretty uh, isolated areas, um, that we are hopeful that this won't become sort of more endemic. But that's, the, you know, these are the steps to take. All right, thank you.
I'm going to talk about Mycobacterium chimera, which is another emerging pathogen, actually was not identified until 2004, and since that time has become an increasing concern internationally in patients who've had cardiac surgery. So we're going to talk about how it was first recognized, what the investigation looked like that identified the problem, and then what we need to be doing here to make sure that we don't have an issue. So this initially was recognized in Switzerland. The University of Zurich had two cases, a little less than a year apart, that were both very unusual. The first case was a 58-year-old gentleman who, two years prior, had had aortic and mitral valve reconstruction and then had an aneoplasty ring placed. Two years after surgery, he started complaining of some pretty nonspecific symptoms, fever, shortness of breath, weight loss. The workup ultimately involved both renal and liver biopsies that had granulomatous inflammation, so they thought perhaps he had sarcoid and had started him on high-dose steroids, but they had not identified any infectious cause of his presentation. The next year, though, despite the prednisone, he had worsening respiratory distress and got admitted with clinical deterioration. He had severe aortic and mitral insufficiency identified on his TEE, and so he went to surgery. His operative cultures from surgery, his sputum culture, and his blood cultures were all positive for AFB. And he died two weeks post-op despite an attempt to treat this. The second patient was 51. He had had in 2010 an aortic dissection that had been repaired with a prosthetic aortic arch, and they had done a mechanical aortic valve replacement as well. About a year later, he came in with several months of fever and on his exams, he was noted to be pancytopenic, he had renal failure, he had LFT abnormalities, and his spleen was enlarged. And he ultimately had a bone marrow biopsy in the setting of the pancytopenia. The bone marrow cultures, his blood cultures, his sputum culture, and his urine culture were all positive, staining for AFB. He was started on treatment, but ended up having a splenic infarct and then ruptured his spleen and had sudden death. And on autopsy, his spleen had granulomatous inflammation and was also positive for AFB. So ultimately, the cultures from both of these patients were identified as Mycobacterium chimera, which is a member of the same family as MAC. It was actually recognized as a separate species in 2004. It's widespread in water and soil samples, so you could identify this outside right now very easily. And the thought is that this is a rare human pathogen, and it was thought to really only cause respiratory infections, pretty similar to MAC. And there's some case reports in the cystic fibrosis population, but not much in immunocompetent patients prior to this. It's also notable for being difficult to kill. About 90% of the organism can live for an hour at 50 degrees Celsius, and it does form biofilms similar to things like Pseudomonas. This is a problem because if it gets on a device, it's very hard to get it off. So as the people in Switzerland looked at these two cases, they had a couple of concerns. The first thing is this is something we had never seen in blood or bone marrow or cardiac tissue culture before. Both of these patients had died, raising the specter that this was highly fatal. And they'd both had cardiac surgery at the same hospital, although two years apart. So what they did was they went looking back at their culture data, and they identified four additional patients in the 2008 to 2012 timeframe who also had cultures positive for Mycobacterium chimera. They'd all had cardiac surgery at the hospital, and none of them were linked outside of the hospital. So none of these people knew each other, frequented the same places. And then they thought, well, maybe these were all cardiac surgeries. Maybe it's from the cardiac surgery device. So they looked at what type of device did they have put in, who manufactured it, what lot number was it. None of those six people matched. What they did find, though, was that there were two clusters, and these are the initial two case patients. You can see that their isolates look almost genetically identical, despite having had surgery two years apart and despite not ever having been in the same place at the same time. So what they thought about at this point is, okay, we know this is something that lives in water. So maybe we have a water source problem in the hospital. So they went looking, and they cultured water everywhere they had it in the hospital, and they grew this out of their drinking fountains, and they grew it out of their heater cooler units in the operating room. And we'll talk about in a minute about exactly what those are and what they look like. But what they found was that they figured these people had not gotten this using a water fountain, 
So they zeroed in on the heater cooler units. And they cultured the air in the operating room when these things were running, and they grew it out of the air. So their initial conclusion, and I'll show you why in a minute, was that their hospital water system was contaminated, that they had contaminated the heater cooler units, and then they'd contaminated the patients. And so these are two depictions. On the far right is the Soren 3T heater cooler unit, that, and it's, this is what we use here at Emory. And what basically happens in these is they're designed to create either hot or cold water that flows into your, uh, your cardiopulmonary bypass machine, or in some cases, a heating blanket. And via diffusion of those temperatures, heats, the, heats or cools the exchanger in the bypass machine, which then heats or cools the patient's blood. So nothing from the heater cooler should ever be in the patient's body. It's just used to change the temperature. But the heater cooler units do have air vents because they are pulling in air to heat the fluid in the machine. And so their thought was that as that water in there was heating and getting agitated and bubbling, that some of those particles were escaping the front of these machines. And they thought, and they filled the water tanks, because these don't touch the patient, they filled these water tanks from their hospital water system. So that's where they thought this came from. However, after they published this case report, other people started publishing their own reports that there were cases in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom, in Denmark, later on in Spain and Ireland. The United States reported cases initially from Iowa and Pennsylvania, and then later Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Hong Kong all started reporting cases. And so the first thought was, you know, maybe this is because this is such an ubiquitous organism in the water, maybe these people are all contaminating their units in the same way. But then they sent genetic sequencing. And it turned out that in, for example, the small outbreak that they had had in Denmark, there were three different hospitals involved. There were less than three SNP differences in those patient sequences in different institutions. And people in the UK, the US, and Denmark all had almost genetically identical isolates to each other, continents apart. And so then they went looking at the facility in Germany where these Soren 3T heater cooler units are made, and they grew an almost genetically identical isolate out of their water system. And it turns out that what they do is when they make these things, they flush them through with the water from their system before they pack them up to seal them to send them. And so the thought was that a little bit of this contaminated water was left in there. It can form biofilms as an organism. And a lot of the tubing and coiling in these things can't be changed out and can't be easily accessed to clean. So they decided that actually what they were dealing with was an outbreak that started at the source of the manufacturing in Germany. So we're left with a big dilemma here because 60% of hospitals in the United States, and more than that internationally, use these machines. Having talked to people here, anesthesiology really likes the way these work. They have a very easy time operating them. This is highly preferable to use. They're not mass produced so either, so it's not like tomorrow we could replace every single device in the United States. We also can't stop doing cardiothoracic surgery. So you're left in a position where, for at least some time, you're going to have to continue to use devices that you know may be contaminated. It's also unclear whether you could completely eliminate this risk. They did do a lot of work at the plant after this problem was identified, starting in September of 2014. So devices manufactured after that date are theoretically not contaminated. But there have been places that have tried to refurbish their device, to reprocess their device. And there have been devices from other manufacturers that have tested positive, although not linked to this outbreak. So it seems to be relatively easy to do this. So then you have the issue of what do we tell patients? What do we tell patients who had procedures before the plant fixed this problem? And what do we tell patients going forward about their risk? And then what do we do in terms of figuring out who has this? As you saw with those two cases in Switzerland, one of those was three years after the initial surgery. The other one was more than a year after the initial surgery. They've averaged anywhere from three months to over five years. So you're looking for people over a very long time frame who may have had surgery at a different institution with a different provider by the time they present. 
You're also dealing with, as we'll talk about in a little more detail, some very nonspecific symptoms. A lot of these people come in with things like fatigue is the most common presenting symptom. If somebody who just had four vessel bypass tells you that they're tired, it's really hard to know what to do with that. And then finally, you have to send dedicated cultures. This won't grow in your normal bacterial blood cultures, and they can take two to eight weeks to grow. So in terms of how we actually assess the risk, we do about 250,000 procedures in the US every year that involve cardiopulmonary bypass, and because of how prevalent these machines are, about 200,000 of them involve these machines. What they've decided is that in hospitals who've reported at least one case, the risk of getting infected having surgery in that hospital is somewhere between one in 100 and one in 1,000. Um, places that haven't reported a case, it's a little more difficult seen anywhere from one in 2,000 to one in 5,000 out of the British surveillance when they did this on a population level. In terms of which procedures are highest risk, because the bacteria forms biofilms on devices, anything where you put in prosthetic material, so particularly valve, place, valve replacements and aortic arch grafts. What they have decided is that there are procedures where the chest isn't open, where these machines are on. So for example, you usually run one of these when you're doing a TAVR in case you have to open emergently. There are some abdominal transplant surgeries where these are run kind of in the background. And so there's some theoretical risk of surgical site infection in those cases too. ECMO also uses a similar circuitry to this, uh, but there have not been clinical cases identified with ECMO, so those patients aren't involved in surveillance. The other problem in terms of the risk is you could say that if your risk is one in 1,000 or one in 5,000, that this is pretty small, and there are things that are a lot more common that we give people in the hospital, but we have anywhere from a third to half to, in one case, 75% of the patients in these case series dying of these infections. So that's why this has really garnered notice. So the FDA and the CDC have issued recommendations, the FDA because they regulate some of the medical devices, and the CDC because they've been surveilling these cases. And so there have been recommendations about device use and maintenance so the machines manufactured after October of 2014 have factory changes. Devices used before that date, people have done everything from trying to keep them outside the operating room to new ways of decontaminating them. The problem is that more aggressive disinfection protocols have actually led some of these machines to disintegrate. Um, and so that has led to people wanting to replace these devices as replacement parts and become available as they're manufactured in Germany. Everybody has undergone case finding efforts. I'll talk about ours. And then patient notification. The CDC actually put together a toolkit for how to do this. This is a sample of the letter that they recommend that people send to patients. So everybody who had surgery before a certain date would get notified. You know, if you experience these symptoms, call your doctor. Of course, then people have to be prepared to deal with that because you're telling people, if you're tired and you have a fever and you had heart surgery in the last five years, call your doctor. And so you also have to notify providers so people know what to do when they start getting these phone calls. So what we've done here is first a retrospective review of all of our culture data to make sure that we don't have people in the past who had grown this and we thought it was a contaminant. Did not find anything that way. Did do the patient notification that's been recommended in the follow-up. Uh, the VA Infectious Disease Clinic, for example, has been doing electronic consults on a lot of these patients as people have called in with symptoms to determine do they need to be seen, do they need cultures, what do we need to do? And then prospectively, now the surgical consent reflects this risk. We've, we do ongoing surveillance to see if this happens, and we are in the process of replacing all of our devices with ones manufactured after the date when they made changes. In doing all of this, we've had one situation at Emory Midtown where they had a patient who had known MSSA endocarditis and a native valve who had never had surgery before, who after explanting his valve surgically, it grew MSSA as expected. It also ultimately was identified as having mycobacterium chimera, the premise there being environmental contamination in the operating room. And that just confirms what we already knew, that if you test these devices that were manufactured before that date, somewhere between 60 and 80% of them will test positive. The CDC actually doesn't recommend doing that testing because they've found that if you test the same device over and over again, one day it's positive, the next day it's negative, one day it's positive, so it doesn't tell you very much. So you just sort of have to operate under the assumption that these devices are contaminated.
So going under that assumption, then what do we do to make sure we identify patients? Because it may be that some of the death rate from these infections is due to the fact that we miss these. So you got patients getting diagnosed years postoperatively. And then one study actually looked at how long from somebody actually having symptoms to when they got a culture that would have detected chimera, and it was a median of 85 days. So it's taking people almost three months to think about it in these patients. And then you've got to think about all of the different surgeries that have these devices in use, including the theoretical risk in some of them where they're running but the chest isn't open. And then you have the unusual situation of while these people had cardiothoracic surgery, they're actually probably more likely to present to their internist or even their ophthalmologist than they are back to their surgeon because the majority of these people have extra cardiac manifestations first and they have included everything from osteomyelitis of the sternum to bilateral chorioretinitis to things that look like malignancy, fever, enlarged spleen, cytopenias, and then hepatitis, nephritis, pneumonitis. So they've had very varied presentations of these patients. And then what they complain about is not specific. 90% of them have fatigue, 75% of them have a fever, 60% of them are having night sweats and trouble breathing and weight loss and about 50% complain of cough. So this could look like TB, this could look like cancer, this could look like the flu. There are a number of things this could look like, so you have to have a high index of suspicion. And because these patients do have granulomatous disease in the setting of mycobacterial infection, an overwhelming number of the ones that have been misdiagnosed have been called sarcoid. And then people have ended up on high-dose steroids and been immunosuppressed in the setting of these disseminated infections. So and this is just the largest case series that was put together by the team at Iowa that looked at 52 of these patients. And you can see that the index positive culture in the majority is not cardiac. A lot of them are blood from disseminated infection, and five of them are on bone marrow biopsy for the cytopenias. So what you need to do when you're seeing patients is have a high index of suspicion over a long time period. So this is people, these are people who had cardiac surgery within the last five years. So I know for me personally, when I'm seeing somebody who came in with fever and I'm trying to figure out why, I'm often, if they haven't had surgery in the last 30 to 60 days, I figure, okay, it's not a surgical site infection. This is maybe not so relevant. This is really relevant in these patients. If they've had cardiac surgery and they've suddenly got fever of unknown origin, other systemic symptoms, Anybody who's gotten diagnosed with sarcoid and had heart surgery in the last five years should probably be looked at under these circumstances. People who've got new prosthetic valve endocarditis, because it could have happened at the time their valve was placed. Cytopenias, renal failure, hepatitis, chorioretinitis. And the final thing is that because Mycobacterium chimera is originally part of the MAC family, and it actually used to be called MAC, they're very similar. Some labs will misidentify it. That actually happened with that environmental isolate that we had at Midtown on the heart valve. That was initially reported as MAC, which Jesse Jacob is the epidemiologist there doing surveillance said this doesn't make sense and had it sequenced. And so if you have high suspicion, then you want to send dedicated testing. You want several sets of AFE blood cultures. Any other culture you get, bone marrow, renal biopsy, liver biopsy, you want dedicated staining and cultures. And if you have something that's identified as MAC in unusual setting, CDC can sequence that. And then you want to notify the ID consult team and infection control, because the ID consult team will talk in a minute about being needed for treatment purposes. Cardiothoracic surgery likewise, because the majority of these have not been able to be medically managed. And then infection control to figure out where the source of potential contamination is in the operating room. And then confirm cases the health department and the FDA need to know, and the CDC is doing voluntary reporting because they're trying to do national surveillance. The problem with these is that 80% of cases in one 10 patient series failed conservative management and had to go to surgery, and some of them needed multiple debridements. When they are, when they are treated, it looks very much like MAC therapy with either clarithromycin or azithromycin, rifampin or rifibutin, and ethambutol. In the patients who are critically ill, they've often added either amikacin or a fluoroquinolone like moxifloxacin in these cases. However, one series of 18 patients in the UK, 50% mortality rate, and of the nine people who theoretically survived, seven of them are not yet considered cured, and they're having ongoing problems with therapy. <laughs> 
So I think what to take home from this is the original experience of the people in Switzerland is one that if you have in the hospital, notify somebody from ID or infection control. If something doesn't seem right, it may turn out to be nothing. But if you have two patients who have the same really drug-resistant organism, if you're getting a culture result that doesn't make sense, those are the things we want to hear about because we can look at it. Things for device use and maintenance in the hospital are critical. So when they actually started looking at the heater cooler units, here's when they took apart, here's what was growing on the back of it. So knowing where these devices are, how they're maintained, how we clean them is important. This was a case too where initially the University of Zurich thought they had an isolated problem they'd caused. It turned out to be an international problem. So we need to have good methods of communicating when these things happen. And these are multidisciplinary efforts because it might be a surgeon, it might be an ophthalmologist, it might be an internist who recognizes this initially. And then finally, this is a case where really taking a good history, including a thorough surgical history matters in these cases. And in all of these cases where you can have these kind of outbreaks, travel history, exposure history, all of these things really matter. And staying current on what's out there. Um, you know, something like Mycobacterium chimera, the first couple cases of this, that 85-day delay to send the test is probably because nobody knew they needed to be looking for it. It's my privilege to go off from these two excellent presentations and talk a little more about recognizing uh, recognizing these things by the people here in this room. And to do that, I'd like to add two cases to the ones we have here. The first is when I came to Grady in 1973, one of the first persons I heard from about problems was Ed Macon, a member of this department and the head of dialysis at, uh, at uh, Grady. And Ed pointed out that in a period of in 1974, 50 cases of hepatitis occurred among the nephrology dialysis center's patients and also in the staff. And after that recognition, the question was why? The answer was ineffective infection control. There was an association between the receipt of intravenous injections and the subsequent development of hepatitis, but the prevalence of hepatitis infection in staff was related to the failure to use gloves. Now you say, everyone should know that, but in 1974, this was not that clear. Uh, Ed and his colleagues from CDC worked this up, and their paper said, the paper supports the hypothesis that contact with blood is the primary method of spread of hepatitis B in dialysis units that contributed to our knowledge of this, uh, this disease. Reporting was to infection control and the CDC. And you've heard about the importance of reporting to different groups. The second outbreak I'd like to report comes from uh, a paper by people from the Department of Medicine again up the, up the street in Vanderbilt reporting on the index case for the fungal meningitis outbreak in the United States. And this group from medicine recognized this because it was an unusual case. And you've heard about unusual cases in the first presentation. Patient with persistent neutrophilic meningitis due to a fungus, but this occurred in an immunocompromised man. We're usually thinking of these diseases in immunocompromised patients. No evidence of usual sources for this fungus. And uh, what they found was that this eventually related to an epidemic of a contaminated drug, but at the time of the first case, they said an epidural steroid injection was identified as a possible route of entry for the organism, and so they reported it to infection control and the state health department. So these were early recognition by people in medicine. The second one related to, this is from the uh, CDC's MMWR, you see an extensive outbreak of fungal infections associated with injection of steroid from a single compounding pharmacy. And when they looked further at the single compounding pharmacy, uh, they found that the pharmacy had 
terrible unsterile conditions. And uh, they also found that the pharmacy executives knew this and were not testing their drugs for sterility. And as you see, they were charged uh, extensively because of production of these contaminated drugs. Note also that cases occurred in seven different states. So the case from Tennessee, from the Department of Medicine, was what triggered the investigation by public health agencies that led to dealing with this, this extensive outbreak. So outbreaks in healthcare, including the ones you just heard about, can be national or can be global, and you've heard about that. They result from uh, things you've heard about already, increasing international travel and industry, production of, production of uh, healthcare devices in one country that have reproductions in country like ours. They involve rapidly spreading organisms, either new ones like Ebola or Middle East uh, syndrome, or known ones. Influenza is still with us. It still causes global outbreaks. SARS was with us earlier. It's disappeared, but it may come back. It's because of more patients with compromised host offenses. They've been mentioned to you. It's because of the increasing use of procedures and equipment, some of them technologically more complicated than those we were used to. And it's also related, as you've heard, to the increasing pressure from increased antibiotic use. That's why we need people who deal with antibiotic stewardship. As you've heard, these require cooperative efforts of healthcare institutions, public health agencies, but finding these in the first place is important, and that's one of the functions of groups like ours. So the take-home points for us, I think, are how do we deal with recognizing this in medicine? And that is recognizing unusual cases like the fungal meningitis I told you about for uh, Vanderbilt, or unusual organisms, the ones you've heard about in these two excellent presentations, or changes in the infection patterns in your practice. An organism like hepatitis B was not that unusual, but the huge change in practice got Ed Macon as a, as a medical physician to say, we need to do something about it. You also need to recognize changes in usual organisms that may be related to drugs, I gave you that example, to instruments and procedures, you've heard that example, or to ineffective infection control, the example from Dr. Macon and the dialysis unit. So all those are important, and you've already heard the importance of reporting. You're not going to be reporting uh, throughout the world, but if you report to infection control, and uh, they probably report to public health and a number of agencies, as you just heard from Mary Beth, then the work that's done by the medical physician is carried out and does something about global outbreaks. So my conclusion is, from these two, two presentations, the ones I've added, is that you are the early warning system and the key to dealing with these global outbreaks. Thanks. <laughs> Can I invite my colleagues up? So we're ready for questions and comments. I'm particularly interested in whether some of you have experience in dealing with situations like the ones you've heard about. Thanks, I'm Susan Ray from Infectious Disease and Hospital Epi at Grady, and this is my hero. I just have to say that, that was fantastic, and you guys were great. Um, I've always been, when I first started as the hospital epidemiologist, associate hospital epidemiologist at Grady, I was waiting every day for the outbreak, because I'd read about them, and I was sure we'd have one any minute. Um, and 
you know, they don't happen all that often. And so after several years, you get um, sort of numb to the profusion of positive results that aren't very exciting and are important to take care of, but they're not a point source outbreak that would be the kind of thing you could be a detective for. And then when we finally had an outbreak, it took me a long time to recognize it. <laughs> so the first step is recognizing that it's not right. <laughs> and um, we had positive Legionella culture or antigen results on a patient that um, didn't make sense clinically and there was an alternate explanation for their illness, multiple alternate explanations. Actually, they had documented two other things wrong that could explain their infectious disease presentation. And my colleague, a young whippersnapper, Carlos Diaz Granados, kept bothering me about the positive result. And he said, we've got a nosocomial case of Legionella. And I kept saying, no, I think that's got to be a false positive urine test. We need to check with the lab. So after three cases of false positive urine test, it was pretty clear that we had a problem. Um, and everything turned out fine, but uh, it was a long story. But the, it, it really, um, I learned a whole lot from that experience and was just uh, too slow to um, recognize that even when a person has multiple problems that you already know about, they can have an additional one. And that was the same issue with the, uh, the first case of TB that caused nosocomial transmission at Grady. Uh, the doctor who decided that it didn't make sense that they were treating the infection they knew about, which was pneumococcal pneumonia with bacteremia. The patient had a low bar infiltrate, had pneumococcus in the blood, they treated that, and the patient didn't get better and didn't get better and didn't get better and coughed and coughed and coughed and coughed. So when the teams changed at the end of the month and the new resident came on, he said, this person has been in the hospital way too long. My list is too long. I have to figure out what's wrong with this person. I'm starting over. So he ordered all the diagnostic tests he could think of for pneumonia, and that included sputum AFV, and it was four plus. So they'd been watching somebody for two weeks who had pneumonia from pneumococcus, but also TB. So that was another outbreak that was detected, but not quick enough. So the take home message is, when infection control isn't listening to you, as the physician, you come back over and over <laughs> and make sure that you stay with it. We're done. Thank you very much. So they were, s I did, and then at Case of the Week, they were both sitting next to Mary Beth, and I was like, you look like triplets back there. <laughs>